Hello and welcome to New Data in Clinical Context, an update on renal cell carcinoma care in early through advanced disease. I'm Dr. Monty Powell from the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in Duarte, California. In this educational activity, we'll explore some of the recent updates and new evidence on the continuing integration of immunotherapy, targeted agents, and novel therapeutics across a wide range of cancer treatment settings. Let's go ahead and begin. Now, um, it's important to acknowledge that there are multiple ongoing trials and approvals and guidelines are truly a moving target in renal cell carcinoma. We're going to spend some time discussing adjuvant therapy, many key developments there from ASCO 2021. We'll move to discussing some of the updates on frontline therapy, and we'll wrap up by discussing some of the updates in the context of refractory or salvage settings. We're going to focus on what oncologists should know, uh, which patients we should include based on clinical trial data with novel regimens, what combination therapy should be utilized, and we'll also try to have some focus on adverse events as well. Now, this is an incredibly impressive diagram that highlights the progress that we've made in kidney cancer therapy. You can see that it starts back in 1992 with the advent of high-dose interleukin-2, and it really spans to the current era. And you can just see how the pace really appears to be changing. Since interleukin-2, the advent of VEGFTKIs like serafinib and sinitinib in 2005, and then it's really been a tidal wave with development of mTOR inhibitors shortly thereafter in 2007 with Tempsirolimus's approval. We then moved to checkpoint inhibitors in 2015 with the approval of second-line nivolumab therapy. The list goes on and on. And of course, one of the major foci of today's talk is going to be some of these new combination regimens, looking at checkpoint inhibitors in combination with targeted therapies and so forth. Now, as the kidney cancer treatment landscape continues to increase in complexity, evidence-based data about patient preferences, goals, and values related to care is absolutely critical. In addition to considering the evidence and best practice recommendations, healthcare providers should really take into account the needs and preferences of patients with kidney cancer and their caregivers to effectively move towards individualized approaches for treatment selection and planning. Now, this is really where patient advocacy organizations play a really pivotal role for you and your patients, as well as their families. It's important to make your patients aware of reputable online sources, such as KC Cure. Now, KC Cure is an evidence-based, patient-led kidney cancer advocacy organization focused on patient education, outreach, and research, and it's a partner in providing this particular educational activity. So let's go first through some highlights from ASCO 2021. We'll really try to focus here on what's new and interesting from this year's meeting. And, and there's really a lot to discuss, frankly. We're gonna start by talking about something entirely novel in kidney cancer, and that's the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting. Now, there really are limited options for patients with localized renal cell carcinoma as it stands right now. We've really come to accept perioperative systemic treatment in diseases like breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, many other diseases you've likely seen in your clinical practice. Now, having said that, there really is no standard of care option in my mind for kidney cancer therapy. Nephrectomy can oftentimes offer a patient a cure, but there is a chance that with stage two and three disease, there's a 20 to 40% chance of recurrence. And of course, we all know that if a patient does recur, that tends to be a non-curative diagnosis in the vast majority of cases. There's no approved preoperative therapies for renal cell carcinoma. There is one already FDA-approved treatment, sunitinib, for high-risk localized RCC after surgery. I have to tell you that I'm not particularly enthusiastic about that. But, you know, let's start by talking about the data that I am really excited about, and that's this trial, Keynote 564. This is a study looking at adjuvant pembrolizumab. So this takes patients with renal cell carcinoma. Importantly, these patients have to have a clear cell component. These patients have the following pathologic criteria. And I think this is really critical as we look to the patient population that we hope to ultimately treat with this regimen in clinical practice. Uh, patients have to have pathologic T2 grade 4 disease. They could have a sarcomatoid component. They could have pathologic T3 or T4 disease or have nodal positivity. In addition to that, and this is something to really pay attention to, patients could have complete resection of metastatic disease. This is something that we really strive for in patients with oligometastatic disease, and those patients were actually included in this particular trial. Patients have to have been within 12 weeks of nephrectomy. That's a good general guideline, I would say, in terms of when you want to implement adjuvant treatment. And these patients were stratified based on the presence of M0 or M1 disease. 
and the factors related to ECOG performance status and uh, whether or not they were treated within the United States. And they were randomized to pembrolizumab. This is a regimen that many of you are familiar with from under, other disease types at a dose of 200 milligrams intravenously every three weeks for 17 cycles. That amounts to 51 weeks, roughly one year, or placebo for the same duration of time. The primary endpoint in this study, and that's something to focus on because all of these studies have distinct primary endpoints, was disease-free survival based on the investigator's assessment. Now this trial met its primary endpoint with a median follow-up of 24 months. You can see that there's an improvement in disease-free survival with adjuvant pembrolizumab versus placebo. Hazard ratio of 0.68, p-value of 0.001. Incredibly, incredibly impressive data here. Now the disease-free survival was actually pretty consistent across subgroups in this study as well. Now the big question that everyone asks in the context of adjuvant therapy is overall survival. And in this study, they actually were able to do a planned assessment of overall survival. And that this early data cut, I do think it's quite early to really assess for this, you can see that there's a difference. You can see that the hazard ratio for overall survival is 0.54 with a p-value of 0.01. So I would suggest that this is the sort of encouraging data that we want to see in terms of an early assessment of overall survival. Of course, in the adjuvant setting, safety really comes to the fore, right? We don't want to offer our patients a treatment uh, that is going to really lead to a lot of long-term deleterious side effects. What do we see here in terms of adverse events? Well, you know, with pembrolizumab, you see that the grade 3 to 5 adverse event rate is around 32% versus 17% with placebo. I don't want to at all undermine the impact of adverse events in this patient population, but I think it's important to bear in mind that patients actually fared fairly well in this experience. Now, conclusions from this trial of adjuvant pembrolizumab. Well, I think it's very clear that adjuvant pembrolizumab elicits some degree of clinical benefit. You can see here that there's a significant and what I would describe to be clinically meaningful improvement in disease-free survival. There's going to be additional follow-up of overall survival. I think that's going to be interesting. I don't know if we necessarily need to see an improvement in overall survival that's marked. A modest trend would probably be enough in my book in this scenario. But, you know, nonetheless, survival is still a critical endpoint in adjuvant studies. We saw a benefit across subgroups in this study. There were no real new safety signals. This is really the first positive phase three study of adjuvant immunotherapy in kidney cancer. Very, very exciting data. Now, this isn't the only player in town. There's multiple other adjuvant studies that we'll read out in the future, if not near future, in the moderately distant future. This is the PROSPER study. This study just finished accrual in February this year. This is an important cooperative group-led effort. And the big difference in this particular clinical trial is that we're not actually looking at adjuvant therapy exclusively. We're testing the premise of neoadjuvant therapy. So patients in this study, once they're registered and ultimately uh, randomized, either receive nivolumab followed by surgery, followed by additional nivolumab, or surgery alone. What other trials do we have in the adjuvant slash neoadjuvant setting? Uh, we have a whole slew of different studies that are underway. In the neoadjuvant space in particular, you see a listing here of multiple studies that I think are ultimately going to have some clinical relevance. Um, you see a neoadjuvant study looking at cabozantinib, axitinib with nivelumab, linvatinib with pembrolizumab. The list goes on and on. So I think there's going to be multiple opportunities to ultimately explore the role of neoadjuvant therapy. The adjuvant therapy trials that are ongoing, which are numerous, looking at atezolizumab in a study that I've led, adjuvant nivolumab with ipilimumab in a BMS-led study, I think these are all going to be really critical efforts. So let's shift gears away from adjuvant therapy and neoadjuvant therapy and talk about frontline disease. This is really where we've made a whole host of, I think, really critical and important advances. I'm going to go start by going through some of the updates from ASCO 2021. And you can see here the Keynote 426 study schema. This is a study that I think many of you are probably familiar with already. We'll go through some of the more recent updates. But it took patients with metastatic disease who had not received any prior systemic therapy. Patients were stratified based on IMDC risk group and the region in which they were treated. And they were randomized to axitinib at a dose of 5 milligrams twice daily. This is a dose I think that we're quite familiar with in clinical practice. There was titration of the axitinib dose, and this was paired with pembrolizumab at a dose of 200 milligrams intravenously every three weeks. On the control arm, patients received therapy with sinitinib. 
Now this is the updated analysis of the data. What really struck me here is that you can actually see with 42 months of follow-up, some diminution in terms of the hazard ratio for overall survival. These data looked a little bit better up front. So I, I still remember very vividly when Brian Reaney first presented this data at ASCO GU and the hazard ratio for overall survival stood at 0.53. Now with additional follow-up over the course of time, what we see is the hazard ratio increasing to a value of 0.73, still statistically significant, mind you. So, you know, I still think that this is a reasonable choice for frontline therapy, but maybe not as impressive as the overall survival signal was right out of the gate. Now, what about progression-free survival? Hazard ratio there was 0.68, still very strong. I would say. Um, I've always pointed out the fact that the control arm here with Sinitinib performed rather well compared to other studies that we see in this space. And that lends itself perhaps to the fact that this study amongst others actually had a very high proportion of patients with good risk disease. And that certainly may have driven outcomes. Ultimately, when it comes to that 42 month analysis, we saw some updated response data. The response rate is hanging at around 60%, but I wouldn't anticipate that to change much over the course of time. The complete response rate, mildly different at 10% in this experience. Now, this is one of the longest follow-ups that we have to date with a combination of checkpoint inhibitor with TKI, so it certainly is informative. Uh, I would say that these results really show that, you know, axitinib with pembrolizumab continues to demonstrate superior efficacy over sinitinib with respect to overall survival, PFS, and response rate. I do want to couch it by mentioning, though, that again, this hazard ratio for overall survival is slipping a little bit, and I think that's something we've got to keep an eye on. The Javelin Renal 101 study is an interesting one. You know, I, I want to be totally candid here. This is not a study that I think has really been implemented much in clinical practice. This study looked at axitinib with avelumab in a very similar context to what we saw in Keynote 426. Patients in the study had no prior therapy. They had a reasonable ECOG performance status. So that was one of the stratification factors and were again stratified by region of the world. In this case, patients received axitinib at the dose of five milligrams twice daily with avelumab, which is given every two weeks. Again, that's one of the caveats of giving avelumab. Sinitinib on the control arm was given at standard dosing. Now, this is the extended analysis. What I would propose here is, again, you know, we're seeing some differences, particularly when you look at the intermediate and poor risk group. You can see certainly a distinction in favoring axitinib with the velumab. It's suggested, though, that patients still need to be followed for the final overall survival analysis. So I think that the fate of this regimen really still hangs in the balance. I think that it's truly probably heavily contingent on how the overall survival ultimately looks from this study. And, and again, we, we're going to have to wait some time to tease that out. Nonetheless, if we look to the updates from ASCO this year, some of the things that you sort of tease out with the data are response rates, progression-free survival, et cetera. They're all superior, particularly in intermediate and poor risk patients, but also amongst patients with favorable risk disease as well. I do think that without overall survival, we're probably going to defer to the other regimens available in this space. Speaking of which, uh, this is the Checkmate 9ER clinical trial. This is a study that looks at a regimen that I, I thought this was a bold exploration that I think is taking a dose of cabozantinib that's lower than what we're used to using in the salvage setting, 40 milligrams a day as opposed to 60 milligrams a day. And this is paired with nivolumab at 240 milligrams IV every two weeks versus sinitinib therapy. This study, like all the others, included patients that were treatment naive. Uh, patients had clear cell histology with potentially sarcomatoid disease in this experience. As we look to the data from this trial as it's been updated, what you can see here, and this is really one of the key tenets with cabozantinib, is that it works across risk strata of disease. And you can see particularly impressive results in the comparison of patients that are poor risk, right? You can see here a marked distinction in terms of response rate. Uh, response rates are highlighted in uh, the red and, and maroon colors here. Uh, and you can certainly see that whether it's intermediate, poor, or good risk disease, you can see that patients who are receiving a combination of cabozantinib with nivolumab tend to fare better. This particular sub-analysis that was presented at ASCO 2021 also highlights the data as it pertains to sites of metastasis. And I think we've long held that cabozantinib is one of those regimens that can have particular impact on the bone. Uh, I think we've seen it in clinical practice. And what really stands out to me is that you can actually see pretty healthy complete response rates, 6% here, in patients with bony metastatic disease. And it really got me thinking about 
the paradigm that I introduce to patients. I've oftentimes told my patients with bony metastases, you know, look, it's hard to really evoke a complete radiographic response. Don't expect it going into these studies. Um, so to me, those data are actually quite impressive. Um, but as you can see here, for sites of metastasis that we traditionally consider to be problematic, if you will, uh, associated with a poor prognosis, such as bone and liver disease, patients are faring better with the combination of cabozantinib and nivolumab. The CLEAR study is one that's drawn a lot of attention. This was a big, ambitious study, the biggest of the phase three studies uh, that we've reviewed to date. And this study took patients with treatment-naive renal cell carcinoma and randomized them to one of three regimens as opposed to just two. Patients either received linvatinib with pembrolizumab. Linvatinib here, and this is a very different paradigm, something I think that's important to emphasize. Linvatinib here was dosed at 20 milligrams as opposed to the 18 milligrams we're used to seeing in the second and third line setting. This was compared to linvatinib at 18 milligrams with everolimus at 5 milligrams and sunitinib at standard dosing. What we see in this trial, and this is a breakdown based on favorable risk disease versus intermediate and poor risk disease, is again a very impressive difference in that intermediate and poor risk category. Now, in this particular study, you can see here a 72% response rate in intermediate porous disease versus 28% with sunitinib. I will couch this data by stating that the linvatinib pembrolizumab data set in CLEAR is one of the larger favorable risk experiences, just like with axitinib and pembrolizumab. You can see that this constitutes about 30% of the study population. And in that favorable risk group, you can actually see perhaps a lesser degree of benefit. Response rate is 50% with sunitinib, 68% with linvatinib and pembrolizumab. So, you know, again, nothing, nothing to sneeze at here. Still impressive response rate with a combination of linvatinib with pembrolizumab. But just as you might anticipate, a lesser degree of benefit in those patients with favorable risk disease who are going to fare better anyways. There was also some important patient-reported outcomes data from ASCO 2021. People have different sentiments when it comes to PRO data. I'm a believer that these data are actually quite important in day-to-day -day clinical practice. Um, with these three studies that I've just highlighted, Checkmate 9ER, Keynote 426, and uh, CLEAR, I'm not including axitinib and avelumab in that mix because it didn't hit overall survival, but with those three studies, we're talking about trials that have demonstrated improvements in response rate, PFS, overall survival, all of the three traditional landmarks that we're going for. So quality of life here is that fourth important metric that we can try to use to distinguish these regimens. It's worth noting that when quality of life was assessed in the context of Keynote 426, we actually did not see any significant differences in terms of uh, clinical outcome there. Having said that, in Checkmate 9ER, it looked as though outcomes were improved amongst patients receiving cabozantinib with nivolumab. In CLEAR, I think it's perhaps a little bit more challenging to, to interpret. You see that in the PRO data, the patient-reported outcome data, there are certain domains that tend to favor uh, linvatinib with pembrolizumab. I would say that on the whole, the data for the two regimens was fairly balanced. So, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, the PRO data is quite critical here. Now, I want to spend just a moment talking about management of adverse events when you're looking at IO plus TKI in combination. I think this Venn diagram over here is an important one, you know, something that you can certainly print out and use in clinical practice. When you're looking at IOs, the exclusive IO toxicity would be things like pruritus, pneumonitis, myocarditis, adrenal crisis. We don't really see that in the context of TKIs. Likewise, the TKI exclusive toxicities might be things like hypertension, taste changes, the things that you see listed in green on the right-hand side there. What's really tricky in clinical practice is dealing with these overlapping toxicities. Both TKIs and IO can potentially cause rash. They can both cause diarrhea, hepatitis, hypothyroidism, et cetera. Uh, I think over the years, we've learned ways to hone this. Um, of course, if patients have really severe toxicity, it's important to stop both drugs. But let's say it's something that's emerging in that blue category there where we have overlap in the Venn diagram. It oftentimes is worthwhile to stop the TKI first and foremost let several half-lives pass, and then reassess the patient. If the TKI is really driving the toxicity, you'll see those toxicities abate. If it's the immunotherapy agent that's doing it, then I think you've got to consider the possibility of discontinuing immunotherapy or starting steroids or whatever the management algorithm calls for based on the severity of toxicity. I wanted to take just a moment here and highlight something that I'm particularly passionate about. We've been talking about all of these pivotal trials in the frontline setting.
Something that really garnered a lot of attention is a study that my group put forward using a live bacterial product called CBM588. Now, CBM588 has such an interesting history. This is a bacterial spore that's commercially available in Japan. In fact, a lot of people use it there for various gastrointestinal ailments. Um, this particular spore deposits in the GI tract and creates butyrate. And this is a very complicated mechanism that I have listed here in the diagram on the right-hand side. But fundamentally, we think that this has a major impact on systemic immunity. And we've actually seen this. There were several papers published in Science three years ago that suggested that specific bacteria in the gut could really drive immunotherapy response. Um, there's some data in the context of lung cancer that I'm showing in the bottom portion of this screen. This is a retrospective study that really supported the fact that using CBM588 could drastically enhance both progression-free survival and overall survival with patients uh, with lung cancer receiving checkpoint inhibitors. This data, I should caution though, is retrospective. So what we did here is I think probably the first prospective assessment of a live bacterial product in patients with advanced cancer. So really excited to share with you this trial, which looks at nevo at uh, the same doses in the context of Checkmate 214, with or without CBM588. This took patients with intermediate and poor risk disease and randomized them to this regimen. And the primary endpoint in this study was actually a biologic one. We wanted to see whether or not there were changes in bifidobacterial species. And in fact, we saw trends towards an increase in bifidobacterium, particularly in patients that were deriving a response to the combination regimen here. What I'll point out, and this is maybe the even more impressive component of things, is at the bottom there, there was a major, major improvement in progression-free survival and overall survival with the combination of a nevo ipi with CBM588. Now, this is a small study, 30 patients on the whole, so I don't want to make too much out of the, the clinical data that we're seeing here, but it's a very strong signal. And so patients come into clinic all the time asking about dietary modulation, what they can do. I think that this is at least one step towards trying to modulate the gut in a manner that could be favorable for treatment response. So now let's shift gears in the last couple of minutes of my presentation and discuss the refractory setting. We've co gone over date, date, great data in the neoadjuvant setting. We've gone over great data in the context of frontline therapy. I want to discuss both some of the successes and failures that we've seen to date in the refractory setting. This is the so-called Cantata trial. This took patients with clear cell renal cell carcinoma and randomized them to receive cabozantinib at a dose of 60 milligrams with or without the agent teleglenostat. Teleglenostat is an agent that modulates glut uh, glutamine uh, pathways within the cancer cell. And it was thought that by doing so, you might actually shut off some of the key metabolic pathways in kidney cancer. Now, unfortunately, the data from the Cantata trial was flat out negative. You really can't drive a pointer between these curves here. Progression-free survival was around nine and a half months on both study arms here. Response rates very similar with the combination of cabozantinib with or without teleglenostat. Overall survival still not mature in this trial, but I would be just incredibly surprised if we saw an overall survival difference in the absence of seeing any difference in progression-free survival. So again, the summary here, no significant difference in progression-free survival between the treatment arms. The treatment is well tolerated, but no significant difference in terms of efficacy. Now let's talk about some data that actually may potentially influence clinical practice. This is the TiVo3 clinical trial. I sat on the steering committee for this study along with the study chairs Brian Reaney and Dave McDermott. This particular trial was based on tevozinib, which is a very potent and specific inhibitor of the VEGF inhibitor. Uh, the VEGF receptor. Now, this trial took patients with previously treated disease, either one or two prior lines of therapy, um, and randomized them to receive either tevozinib or serafinib. Now, this is a trial that I think is really relevant to our day-to-day -day clinical practice because it allowed for patients that had received both prior VEGF TKI and prior IO. So, you know, we can potentially extrapolate from the TiVo3 data what we might do in the second and third line setting and beyond in our patients with advanced renal cell carcinoma. Now, in the TiVo3 clinical trial, some of the updated data that we presented were beyond meeting the primary endpoint of progression-free survival was a significant improvement in duration of response with tevozinib versus serafinib. The duration of response with tevozinib was 20 months, with serafinib just 9 months. The hazard ratio of overall survival was 0.91, so that metric is actually getting a bit better over time as the data matures, which I'm quite excited about.
You can also see here the differences in response rate with tavazinib versus serafinib. Again, this really seems to heavily favor tavazinib, a 23% response rate versus 11%. And keep in mind, this is in patients with two to three prior therapy. So we're talking third or fourth line therapy. So impressive to see that we can salvage uh, a good number of patients in this setting. Now, what about safety with this regimen? I always like these tornado plots that's on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. And, and you can see here that certainly there's some toxicities that you need to focus on management with, with tavazinib. Hypertension really stands out as one. Uh, fatigue stands out as another. But by and large, patients actually fare much better with tavazinib than they did with serafinib. Uh, it seems as though there's less diarrhea, less hand-foot syndrome, less nausea and vomiting, less rash. Uh, and so these are all key study characteristics that I think really distinguish Devozinib over serafinib, and perhaps even many of the other TKIs that we have in our arsenal currently. So, you know, particularly for those patients that are frail, ones that can't tolerate more aggressive therapy, I think this really reflects a very, very reasonable treatment option. We also presented at, some, uh, at the meeting some data pertaining to dose reductions and the time to onset of dose reductions in these studies. One of the key points from this bottom right-hand table is that it seemed as though dose reductions were employed to a lesser extent with tavazinib versus serafinib, and it also seemed as though you can sort of push out the onset of dose reductions here, suggesting that patients were tolerating higher doses for longer, and that might have actually led to the efficacy signal that we saw in the context of this study. Multiple other presentations from ASCO21, some data that we really you know, don't have time to go over. There was a trial looking at the combination of cabozantinib with pembrolizumab here. You can see a response rate of 60%, which is quite impressive in this setting. Median progression-free survival of 10.4 months. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not those uh, permutations of cabozantinib with other TKIs become relevant, with other IOs essentially become relevant. There was some updated data from the Titan study, which looked at nivolumab with ipilimumab in patients that had previously received nivolumab therapy. Um, it did seem as though there were improved responses. Uh, I would say that this isn't necessarily a game changer. Uh, half of patients that received boosts for progressive disease um, to either partial response or stable disease um, had, uh, had improved outcomes with nivolumab therapy. So, you know, so, some interesting data from Titan, but nothing that I think changes the game. If you're going to use nevo -Ipi, it should probably be used up front by and large. So, you know, in terms of the overarching takeaways from ASCO 2021, I would suggest that the big, big development, of course, was adjuvant therapy. You know, that's a real game changer, and I do think that adjuvant pembrolizumab is something that's on the near horizon for our patients with localized kidney cancer. I would suggest that there is also a lot of tidbits of data that help us navigate around frontline therapy for the disease, uh, which I'm quite excited about. I would say that at the end of the day, as I look to the cumulative data that we have from Keynote 426, Checkmate 9ER, and CLEAR, I might summarize by saying that all three of those studies hit endpoints of progression-free survival, response rate, and overall survival. And fundamentally, I think that it's really key that we as clinicians get together with patients and their families and, and really educate them on some of the updates in renal cell carcinoma and have them at the table participating in some of these decisions around adjuvant therapy, frontline therapy, and beyond. I want to wrap up by uh, suggesting that the evidence that we've seen here today really shows that we're continuing to make immense progress in the management of kidney cancer across many different disease settings. And I'm hoping that this is ultimately going to improve outcomes for our patients in real world practice, not just in clinical trials. Thank you so much for joining us. And I certainly hope that you found this program useful for your clinical practice. This activity is accredited by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education and developed in partnership with the Kidney Cancer Research Alliance.